Welcome into the Locked On Knicks podcast. I'm Gavin Shaw, and I have the latest on OG Anadobi and Julius Randle's injuries and how they'll shape the Knicks playoff future. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Knicks, your daily New York Knicks podcast. I wanted to thank you for making Locked On Knicks your first listen today and every day because we're now available on all platforms. So if you want to become an everyday, all you have to do is subscribe on YouTube and hit that notifications bell to ensure you never miss an episode. But if you're saying, hey, I'm tired of looking at that guy. Well, I have a solution for you. All you have to do is hit the auto download function on your podcast app of choice. But who's talking to you? I'm Gavin Shaw, your favorite play by play broadcaster's favorite play by play broadcaster. And I've been covering the NBA uh, for 10 years now. Wow, that's a long time. Started to feel a little old as a credentialed reporter for a good chunk of them covering the Phoenix Suns. And today, um, uh, no Alex, but pinch hitting for him is our buddy John Schmelk, um, who does a whole lot of work covering the Giants and had a little podcast called the Bank Shot Pod back in the day covering the New York Knicks. And we got to a whole bunch of fun topics um, and give you the latest on Julius Randle and OG Ananobi. So without further ado, let's get into it right now with John. All right, guys, as promised, uh, we are lucky enough to be joined by John Schmelk. He is the pre and post game and podcast host uh, for the New York Giants. And he's to host a little podcast called uh, The Bank Shot that I was a big fan of and got to go on a few times covering the New York Knicks, as you can tell by the jacket. Uh, still a fan of the team and still one of their best observers. Uh, John Schmelk, welcome to the show. Thanks for joining me, buddy. And proud season ticket holder as well. Gavin, always good to talk some Knicks with you, man. Wow, I didn't realize how many how many games do you get out to a year? Not many. I mean, I have two kids now. I mean, I think we used to probably get out to like 12 or 13. Now me and my buddies probably get out to like five, maybe six over the course of the year. Uh, but gosh, I've had tickets since I think I'm going on about 15 years now, something like that. I'm, 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 I've am I'm, had them for a while. I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but if you need a break from the relative malaise of the Giants, you can go to the organizational stability and, and, and competency represented by the New York Knicks. We went through a lot of rough years with those tickets. Yeah. This is what I call the payoff, my friend. Yeah, you've, you've you've more than earned it. Um, and I, what we're going to talk about today is is if what we've earned, we are actually going to get because uh, there is it's not even a feeling. We, we got to see it for 14 games, just how special this team can be. Um, and the concern now is, will we ultimately get to see it? So the latest on OG and Anobi uh, we had from uh, Woj the other night that uh, he's expected to miss the game against the Nuggets through the flare-up and his, that his return is ominously quote-unquote uncertain. Um, and then this from Ian Begley today, he said the approach to Ananobi's current ailment will be a conservative one. Per people briefed on this matter, the team will not rush Ananobi back, but it's worth noting that the irritation in his elbow has shown improvement since Monday. People briefed on the matter said on Tuesday. So, John, this is kind of an unfair first question because you're not a doctor, but I I'm going to ask it anyways. Uh, what's, what's your concern level at this point about OG Ananobi? To quote the great Tom Thibodeau, that's a medical thing, Gavin. Yeah. <laughs> I'll leave it to the doctors. Um, look. All right. Thanks for coming on, man. <laughs> no, no problem. Ha happy to be with you. We'll see you next time. Um, look, I think uh, the MRI was clean, and that's the most important thing, right? Mm -hmm. So my guessing is that my guess is that this is just residual um, inflammation from the procedure to remove the elbow chip. Uh, you know, the bone chip that was in the elbow that was causing that irritation, and. Sometimes it just takes some time for that inflammation to go down. You try to push it too quickly. The inflammation comes back and that's how you get elbow pain. And I'm, you know, I'm sure if you get to the postseason, you can start shooting the thing up if you need to with cortisone shot, whatever you need to do, right. To, to kind of get that inflammation down. That's probably not something you want to do in the regular season because you actually want it to heal. So he's hundred percent once you get there. Um, so I'm not that concerned. Um, I think it stinks that it's going to take some time for a team that's fighting for a playoff positioning. And you want him out there because, you know, 15 and two with them, or is it 16 and two now after the Golden State win, right? Yeah. You know, he's very valuable. You could argue even with Randall back, he's not the second best player on the team, but he might be the second most important player on the team with how much he contributes and the way he does. So, I mean, it, it stinks, but am I concerned that like he's not going to be available for the postseason? No, I don't, I don't have that on my radar right now. Yeah, we, we did a whole, I won't belabor the point because we did a long pot on it with our buddy XJ, but I think going into that Kings game, the Knicks were plus 46 with Brunson and OG on the floor without Randall per 36 minutes. And we got, I, you know what, I'll, I'll, I'll bring this up quickly because I'm curious your, your take on it. Like, and, and now this might change because we might not get quite the sample size we wanted, but I was kind of curious to see like if the Knicks just 
dominated like with OG and and Brunson and you you just kind of realize like all right this is the power of having genuinely four out spacing around Jalen Brunson like would that be an impetus to like move Randall out for more of a shoot first player or I guess like a player of similar caliber but with greater gravity than what Julius Randall has. Um, and and we, we were probably just not going to get enough information on what those lineups look like this year, unless they're a fixture of the playoffs. But I, I'm still wondering if that's something on the Knicks radar. And, and that's what they see, like the best case scenario future with Brunson um, having four out around him at all times. With Randall, you kind of have three and a half out. Do you think Josh Hart has more shooting gravity than Julius Randall? Not necessarily. That's almost like the presumption there is like, is that like you're going to upgrade? I mean, it's, first of all, it's a great point because it's not something we even touched on the episode. I mean, I but, think teams are yeah. more, I, honestly, I'm just being honest. I think teams are more willing to leave Josh Hart wide open than Randall. Because if yeah. you leave Randall wide open for an open three, he could just get a full head of steam to the basket. And once he's going full speed to the hoop, there's no stopping him. Josh Hart, on the other hand, could dribble into somebody, throw a bad pass, turn it over. So I don't, with yeah. Hart as the replacement, I don't see it if it's, bogey in there and you're talking about a true five out then we can have the conversation but that's not what Tom Thibodeau is going to do right yeah so I, I, think, I think I think the premise of this was like if you could and this is this is going really hot heavy but like if you get like a Paul George type guy in there and maybe that's a dumb question because a lot of people would have said all right I'd always rather have a Paul George than a Julius Randle but I'm like if you had like a genuine two-way wing that could really shoot the basketball like is like like because it just seems like even I mean to your point like on paper, that's right. And we, we only have a small sample size of it, but the lineups of at least so far with Brunson and Ananobi versus Brunson, Ananobi and Randall, they've been a little bit better with just Brunson and Ananobi. So I don't know. I think it could be something. Yeah. That's interesting. Look, I, I, I do think though, we've seen this without Randall. If Brunson's not playing at peak efficiency, the offense can get real ugly for stretches, yeah. man, really ugly. And I do think you need another guy, especially when you get to the postseason. And we even saw it in, in some of these games, right? We saw it at the end of the Laker loss a couple months ago or a month ago now. We even saw it at the start of the Warriors game. Uh, it was the fourth quarter of another game. I don't remember which one where teams just say, all right, we're just going to double team Jalen Brunson every time he touches the ball and we're not yeah. going to let him beat us. Now against the Warriors, he did a great job of throwing some of those pocket passes to Hartenstein. And then he made plays from the short roll spot. So it, it worked, but you get to the playoffs and let's say, this is my worry. You get to the playoffs, and let's say you get the Mammy Heat in the first round, right? I don't know how that happens, but let's just say in whatever world we're living sure. in. Yeah, four or five. Yeah, and they right. Yeah, and Randall's not out there. Let's say Randall's shoulder; he can't come back, and he's done. You don't think Eric Spoelstra is going to figure out a way to beat the Knicks if Jalen Brunson's their only guy that can create his own shot? I mean, that's what happened last year, right? I don't yeah. feel great about it. I, yeah. I just don't. So, and but at least Randall there had gravity. And people yeah. forget the Knicks don't win Game Two of that series at the Garden without Julius Randall. He murdered the heat zone in that game. He was really good on that Sunday afternoon game in game two hmm. um, when he came back from that ankle injury. So I don't, I think that's a tough series. You know, if Spolstra knows that Brunson's the only playmaker and he's clever enough, he'll figure out a way to trap effectively. And he's going to figure out a way to say, okay, we're going to make you pass the ball to Josh Hart and we're going to make Josh Hart make the right play. And I love Josh Hart. He's a really valuable player. You don't want him in that position. That's not what he's good at. So. I think that's why Julius Randle is still very essential to this team, uh, given the lack of uh, shot creation from pretty much every other player on the roster. Yeah, and I think I like again, this was a, a wider conversation, but I, I want to be clear again with some of the comments. I think people who just read the title like didn't really appreciate this. Like I, I, I don't, I don't think the Knicks are a better team without Julius Randle this year by any means. Like he's put together an All NBA caliber season, and also like to your point, come playoff time, like you just need someone who can like just handle a certain amount of possessions. And there's there, D Dante DiVincenzo is a regular season innings eater, like third reliever. Great. Like in the playoffs, like you need someone like Julius Randle. And I think this team is pretty well equipped to bring out a better version of him than we've ever seen in the playoffs before. And I, I almost think it's like there, I maybe, maybe this is a small sample size of us just going off our YouTube comments, but there just seems to be this assumption. Like, 
all right, like we don't really need Julius for the first round. Like we'll get out of the first round. Like maybe if you play the Magic, sure. If you play any other team, like, like if, especially if you get the Cavs in the first round, I know we just like we ran through the Cavs, and I understand why people are incredibly confident against them. You don't have Julius in any form or fashion that series. Like that is very much a toss up to me. Even with yeah, Julius, one of the reasons they series. they ran yeah. through. I'm sorry for interrupting. One of the reasons yeah, they ran on. through Cleveland is because they were just able to pound the you-know-what out of him in the paint. Well, yeah. guess what? Guess guess who's one of the next most physical players in the paint is? Julius Randle. Yeah. And it, him beating up the Cavs front line had a lot to do with that, even though he didn't shoot well in the series. No. Just his physical presence inside makes a difference, and, and Precious doesn't bring that type of physicality down there. No, I mean, go back to, like, I thought the first half of Game 5 was the only, like, healthy-ish version of Randall we saw last year. And it was incredibly encouraging because like he recognized exactly what he had to do. And he was, he was bullying Evan Mobley for that game. And that was like, even though he like, he ended up getting hurt and like, he couldn't really finish it. Like that set the tone for like, all right, this is it. This is a series. Like you, you just have no answer to it. And like, I think where people are ultimately confident with Cleveland, like, yes, they're better. Like, yes, they're going to be harder to guard with, with Struce playing those minutes instead of a Coro playing those minutes in a better version of Karis LeVert. But at the end of the day, like if they can't handle the Knicks physicality, it doesn't really matter. But if Julius Randle isn't on the court, then this conversation doesn't matter. So the latest on Julius Randle, um, this is from Ian Begley. Um, he had a report last week that there was some internal concern regarding the idea that Randle hadn't yet been cleared for contact. It does like just from like an emotional perspective, like feel like that has been like proposed now pretty much since the all-star break and he's yet to cross that hurdle. Um, and, and that was true as of the Kings game, though Ian also added three people I spoke to are familiar with the situation, express confidence that Randall would ultimately return to the court. He has been sidelined since January with a shoulder ailment. So John, I'll, I'll take the same temperature check with you on Julius that I did with OG. I think my like, and maybe this is just life of being beaten down as a Knicks fan, but I just, I don't think we're getting a version of Julius that like is not playing through significant pain and is not at least hampered by this the rest of the year, even if he's on the court. All right, guys, we are going to continue discussing the Knicks playoff prospects and how they're shaped by Julius Randle's injury. Passion, drive, and patience. What brings home the winning trophy is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance from superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has got you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, you always find exactly what you're looking for with eBay Guaranteed Fit. Your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need, the prices you want, it's easy to turn your car into the MVP and bring home that win. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit only available to U.S. customers. Yeah, that's the worry for me. I think there are two parts of this, right? I feel like Julius Randle will be back at some point, whether that's by the end of March or whether that's by the middle of April, right before the playoffs. I don't know the answer to that. Only the Knicks do. Um, I do think playing this conservatively with him is smart. You know, that's something you have to strengthen up to prevent a reseparation, which would then put him out for the year, probably have to have surgery. He could even miss the start of next year, depending on yeah. how that goes, right? So I think they're wisely being careful with him and they want to strengthen that and have him be as confident in the shoulder as possible before they allow full contact. We saw Julius Randle last year playing through pain. He's not going to tell them that he, it hurts. He's not going to tell them that he can't play. He's going to play through it. He's going to play poorly. Fans are going to kill him for it. And then all of a sudden, like last year, a week after the season, oh, Julius Randle is going to have shoulder surgery and he's out for five months. Like yeah. that's what's going to happen if they make sure, if they just let him go, he's not going to tell him. All right. That's just how Julius is. Fans might get annoyed by the product, but give the guy credit. He wants to be out there. He wants to play and he's tough as hell and he, fight, he plays through pain. So that's why there are two concerns here. One, you bring him back too early, then he re-injures it before the playoffs and you lose him completely, okay? That's one thing that could theoretically happen if you try to bring him back too early. That's why the conservative approach is fine by me. The second part of it is the one that you mentioned, right? He comes back, he tries to play through it, and much like when he tried to play through the ankle last year, he's a shell of himself. And then with his other liabilities on the court in terms of his defense, getting back, hustle times, is he helping the team if he's not a really good offensive player? Now, luckily, it's not a shooting shoulder. It's his off shoulder, but he bangs in the post. He bangs as a rebounder, as a driver. You know, that's still something, and I'm sure they're going to put a brace on it, that could limit him and make him more hesitant as the type of player and the way he usually plays. So those are the two things I'm worried about. That's why I would like to see him out there. 
um, at least for a few games before the playoffs, just to get a feel for what he is and where he's at. I would hate for his first game back to be like game one, round one of the postseason, and they got to try to figure things out. So I'd love to get him back, you know, beginning of April, get him on the court for a couple of weeks, figure out where he's at, and then you can plan around whatever version of Julius you're getting when he actually is on the court. Yeah, I'm 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 totally with you. Like I I just think for a guy who to your point is like is extraordinarily tough, but has clearly had moments where like the pressure of being the guy for the Knicks has, has gotten to him and like we've we've seen like the disastrous outcomes that can have in terms of fan perception, uh sometimes in terms of a uh, podcaster perception, raising my hand for people uh, watching on audio right now. Um it's it it has it's been a toxic mix and like if he's back for game one and like it just doesn't look good like it can snowball in a way like I think even beyond like him physically and I and I think that's what you're getting at and yeah go ahead yeah and by the way just to throw in another thing too and I this is kind of an aside but I've been thinking about this mm -hmm. they've been officiating the games very differently the last two weeks it's a great point yeah and I think if you just drop him into the postseason and all of a sudden he's playing he's getting all this contact he's not getting calls. We all know Julius can get a little mental with stuff like that. I want him to get used to the new way they're calling the game, which I think is better, by the way. I like it. Fewer yeah. free throws. Let him play. It reminds me more of the contact around the room in 90s basketball when they wouldn't give guys calls on all those you know types of drives unless you're Jordan when you got to call on every drive. But I think you want to drop him in early to get him used to this – new age of NBA basketball where they're allowing a lot more contact around the rim and let him get used to that. Because if he comes back first game of the playoffs, the shoulders bothering him. Then he gets mad at the officials. Then he starts missing shots because he's rusty. My gosh, to your point, the fan and podcaster reaction, it's going to be, you know, sun's out, guns out, man. People are going to be pissed. You're, you're going to bring your show back just to really, yell. really <laughs> fast. And I don't yeah. want that for him because it wouldn't be fair to him. So mm -hmm. that's why I think just to wrap up the Julius part, get him back when you can. Don't be too aggressive, but I, I want to see him out there for a couple of weeks before, um, before that postseason, so we can at least see him on the court and see what we got. Yeah, and I, I think there there is going to have to be a reacclimation period. Because you have to balance the fact that Dante's taking on a bigger role, like Josh Hart's taking on a much bigger role, and and those things are great. And I look at all of them as like, all right, like what are the silver linings of these injuries? Like I think you probably unlocked, even though he hasn't been shooting one of the last few games, like a level of confidence in Dante that you never would have gotten. You, you figured out, all right, like Precious is like a legit rotation piece. Like maybe we, we can get into this, but maybe even over Bojan. Um, and then the Bojan part of it is is interesting because I think part of the, like I, it was described when they got him as he was sort of the OG fill-in, but I wonder if he was a little bit of like Randall insurance as well. That like oh. to your point, like, like if Randall came back, but like was less than a hundred percent, like, the Knicks could protect themselves and protect him by saying, all right, maybe we're playing Bowie on 20 minutes this game. And Julius is only out there for 28 and like, whatever he's giving you great. Uh, but like the nights, like where the shot isn't going down and to your point, like the defense isn't there that like, you have someone else to go to, but I'm wondering like how slippery that slope gets. If like, if Bojan doesn't turn it around and like, obviously he's had, he had a nice fourth quarter against the Kings, but like in a bigger picture sense, like what does that look like? And how do the Knicks, figure out like, all right, what lineups do we want on the floor at the end of games? Um, Like in game six against the Cavs or like, I don't, I don't know, even game five against the magic. Like, like what do they want that to look like? Yeah. I don't mind the way Bogdanovich is playing. Like, I don't yeah. think he's at a sort. So like, he's not like taking terrible shots. He's not turning it over or making bad decisions. It's, it's more so the defense probably. And then, like, oh, the, no, they, no, it no, feels no. worse when the shots aren't falling, but I, I know, go ahead. Yeah. But we, we all know his defense wasn't good and his defense yeah. has been bad. Like mm -hmm. there's no argument. It's been bad. I'm not going to you know make that case. It is what it is, but I feel like he's getting decent quality shots and he's missing them. Right. I, I don't think he's forcing. He's missing layups around the rim. He's missing a wide open threes. I was watching the warmups the other day. I was at, I got to the game early the dude didn't miss. He hit like 30 straight threes. I'm not even being like over. I'm not even over volume. He like yeah. did not miss. So I think there's a confidence issue right now. And, and maybe he's still getting used to playing with the Knicks in the system or whatever. I still think he's going to be invaluable when you get to the playoffs to stretch the floor with those second units. Um, you know, hopefully Thibodeau will leave either Randall and Brunson on the floor at all times and wrote and, you know, stagger him a little bit better than he did last year. But I think having bogey out there to stretch the floor, uh, I, I do think is essential in the postseason because I think 
you know, back to Randall for a second, I think his ability to draw double teams, he draws double teams better than Brunson does, to be honest with you, because he catches the ball close to the basket. Guys have to collapse and he'll get Dante DiVincenzo and Bogdanovich and Brunson, by the way, whose three point percentage has dropped since Randall has gone out because he's taking tougher threes. He'll get those guys wide open threes all day long. And, and OG Ananobi for that, for that matter. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, I do think bogey is going to be essential. And if I had to guess, I think the guys in that playoff rotation, if Mitch comes back, I think it's going to be Mitch. I think it's going to be Bogdanovich. I think it's going to be Hart. And I think it's going to be McBride. That would be my guess. And then Burks is kind of like you are. Do we need another guy type of yeah. type of thing? Um, now that changes. If McBride goes cold over the next three weeks, four weeks, he might get taken out completely. Um, and if bogey doesn't play a little bit better, I could see him getting yanked in favor of Burks or something like that. But that would be my feel for it right now. If these guys play to the back of their cards. Yeah. I think, I think two things on that, just, just because you, you brought it up. Like I I'm interested again, like if, if Randall's just period healthy enough to be out there period, I think people are underrating like how much of a positive it will be for him to have OG on the floor in RJ spot because the decision making, like I think as much as the bad shooting has been the killer for the Knicks, like first against the Hawks and then against Miami. Um, and I just, I, I having like a spacer at that spot and it just makes Julius's reads so much easier. And we started to see that I think for the 14 or so games we got with them. And I think in the playoffs, like for people watching night in and night out, like that'll only become clearer. All right, guys, we're going to wrap things up talking about our preferred Knicks playoff matchup and what Deuce McBride's future will ultimately look like on the New York Knicks. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little further? Ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Our friends at Nissan have a lineup of SUVs with the capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drivers and great escapes. Class-exclusive Google built-in is your always-updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone, Google Assistant, Google Maps, and Google Play Store built right into the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system the 2024 rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure the 2024 nissan armada will change what you expect from a full-size suv picture a rugged four by four that can seat up to eight in first class luxury and style tow bigger and explore further in the 2024 armada take the nissan rogue nissan pathfinder or nissan armada and go find your next big adventure shop nissanusa.com yeah, and I think that's – look, we were going to talk about what the Knicks ceiling is, and I think that's what it is, right? I mean, you roll out, and that's why they made all these consolidation trades. We were talking about them having to do it eventually, and they did it. And now, you know, amazingly, they still have about 10 guys they'd like to play if they could, maybe 11 if you want to count Burks in that mix, that you're not going to play in the postseason. So you still have guys you want to play, uh, but that's why you, you know, trade quickly and Barrett for OG Ananobi because you see if everyone's healthy what they can be. Now – that might not be this year, right? If OG doesn't, you know, get a shooting straight because of the elbow. And I could see that being the case too. Like OG comes back, ends up playing like he usually does, but his shooting never comes back because of the elbow. I could see that, you know, Randall is hundred percent. So we don't see that ultimate version of the Knicks we are looking for this year. I still think they can still win uh, around the playoffs, even if that's the case. But I think you see what the upside can be when everyone is there and ready to go, which is why the trades were still, Smart. I mean, you could argue if, if Bogey never starts playing well and Burks continues to play poorly, then the Grimes trade was a waste. I'll buy that. I like Grimes. Um, but I think given all the injuries with Ananomi and Randall, bringing a guy like Bogdanovich, I think was important. I think he has won them a couple of games uh, that he has shot well in over the course of the last couple of months. Um, but look, I, I think you see the ceiling. You just don't know if it's going to be this year because of the injuries. And, you know, that's just bad luck. I mean, what can you do? Randall's never hurt. He happens to get hurt. Ananobi continues to have the weirdest injuries known to mankind to miss games, and that continues. Uh, hopefully it stops continuing at some point. But I, I still think you do see the core of this team moving forward, and it'll be interesting to see how they try to kind of make that one final move this offseason to, to create the roster that Leon Rose thinks can compete for a title. Because I think this there's still one move short from competing with a team like Boston, uh, but I think they can compete with any other team in the Eastern Conference, including the Bucks. Yeah, I'm with you. And I, I think the Knicks, I mean, they struck a great balance, right, of, of not giving away their future in in as far as like that Emmanuel quickly just probably was never going to be back. 
Um, and Quinn Grimes like was seemingly trending that direction as well. And, and RJ Barrett just didn't really make sense on this team as, as well as he's played offensively in Toronto um, and, and still getting better. And you, you compare like I can't help in my mind, but compare it to a team like the Suns that is is all the way in and then somehow found a way to go like 20 percent further than that. Like, I think they're the first team in NBA history to be all the way in twice over. And yeah. like the Knicks are probably better than the Suns at, at relatively full strength. And like, maybe like, I'm sure some people would, would possibly rightly argue like the Suns have a higher ceiling. Like, I don't think so. I think the Knicks are, are just a better team. And, and that is without trading any of their picks and having three or four additional picks to work with. So it's impressive work by the Knicks either way. They're in a good position either way. I, I guess just to wrap up this, this conversation, before we finish up on, on a little, little toilet talk, little, little deuce big ride. Um, what do you want their playoff matchup to be? Because I've gone back and forth on this just because I I respect the magic. I respect everything they've done this year. I think they have incredible future. Powell's amazing. Franz is amazing. They're they're tough as hell. You're gonna get some uh forget 90s style basketball, maybe early 50s style basketball. That's the series. Um, I am very confident that a relatively healthy version of the Knicks would dispatch the magic in four or five games. Of course, that means you're looking at Boston, um, barring the heat, getting the eight seed and just just beating them um in round two. Um, or you get Cleveland, which despite what the Knicks did to Cleveland last year, I think would, would probably be a war. Um, and you avoid Boston one round further. Like what, what, what are kind of your, your thoughts as I, as I play that out? The team that I worry about the most in the first round is the heat. And again, mm -hmm. I'm not sure how that happens, but yeah. they just Eric Spolcher and then those guys, they scare me. Yes. Um, I feel like having Ananobi in there to guard Jimmy Butler gives the Knicks a huge advantage because I think Butler would really struggle to score against Ananobi with his size and strength. Um, but look, they're just so well coached, right? And, you know, Adebayo gives Randall so many issues that I think that would be a really tough series. I just don't think the Pacers defend well enough. I think eventually that'll catch up with them as long as the Knicks don't, you know, go completely cold from three for a series. I don't see how they would lose that series just based on how bad defensively the Pacers are. Orlando, I respect them. I, I still think they don't have enough shooting, to be honest with you. Now, if they get hot and Franz, you know, Franz Wagner, who's right now, I think, under 30% or just at 30% from three this year, if he you know, goes on a hot streak, you never know. They're a good team. But I feel good, and I think they, they just match up well against Cleveland. I think we even see that when they played them in the regular season this year. Now Mitchell's dealing with this knee. Um, to me, uh, that I would want to avoid Miami, and I'm with you. I would just... I would rather be the six seed than the four seed and have to play on the road. I'll take on the road at Cleveland because I just feel like the Knicks, they're not bothered by playing in Cleveland at all. It's like not even like they don't care. Yeah. Like it, it doesn't bother them um, to avoid Boston. I I, I kind of, what I want to see, I want to see the Knicks play Milwaukee in the second round. And I want to see how that series goes. I think that would be fun to watch. I'm curious to see how it would go. Um, and I think that would be a fun watch. So that that that's kind of what I'm hoping for is to get a, a second round series against the Bucks. And I would really rather avoid Boston until you have to play them because they're really, 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 really good. And the Knicks probably can't beat them yet, which is fine. Uh, they're not there yet. But I would love to see a second round series against the Bucks. And I'll roll the dice uh, playing on the road at Cleveland uh, for a you know, a seven game series in round one, because I think the Knicks would do well in that series. Yeah. I think, I think the Bucks and Celtics, I mean, outside the fact that the Celtics in a vacuum are so much better, they're polar opposites and that the Celtics have the best possible matchup for Brunson with, with their two guards and, and the size that KP brings at the rim and, yep. and the ability of like Brown and Tatum to switch on him and not be totally lost versus Milwaukee who like, and I think this was clouded in, in like the long stretch where they dominated the Knicks and they still won what like eight out of nine, nine out of 10 against the Knicks. Like, there's just no good matchup that they have for Jalen Brunson. There's no one that can bring in that can bother Jalen Brunson. And like, they can, they can have Brooke Lopez like drop all day. And like Brunson's going to be raining threes. There's going to be raining like pull-up twos and the Celtics can employ that same strategy. And it's very different because um, Drew holiday is as physical and as good getting through screens as anyone in the NBA. Derek white is as good as like those backside contests, like chase down blocks as anyone in the NBA. Damian Lillard is not going to be doing that. And like, that would give me, some measure of confidence in the series, like especially if the Knicks have Mitch back, have Randall, and can like 
bang with like Giannis and Lopez because what's always bothered me about the Bucs is like they just kind of take what the Knicks do and do it better with that size and physicality. But I'm wondering if those tables could turn a little bit with Lopez getting a little bit earlier and the Knicks obviously leveling up on the wings in such a significant way with OG. Like, like I, I, I don't think the Knicks... The Knicks have never had a better shot at Milwaukee than than they do now. Agree, and I, I think their length would bother the Knicks. I do. I think that's that's something you really kind of have to have a real concern about. But just on the Cavaliers, look, they have an easy schedule in the next couple of weeks, right? They play the Hornets a couple times. They get the Sixers a couple times. But they also have a game. They play the Heat. The next three games are against Miami, the Timberwolves, and then the Heat again. So those are three tough games. Then they have the Hornets and the Hornets and a, and a home and home in the Sixers. So those aren't very tough. Then they have to go on a West coast trip, right? They get, they have to go to Denver to take on the nuggets. They have to go to Utah, which is not an easy game playing in that altitude to Phoenix, to the Lakers, to the Clippers before they wrap up their season against Memphis, Indiana and uh, Charlotte again. So, I think the Knicks still really is a chance to get the three seed, to be totally honest with you. With that tough schedule for Cleveland, um, I could see them, you know, have really struggled on that West Coast trip. And if Donovan Mitchell is not back, if he is to miss some more games, maybe they'll struggle in the next three against those really tough teams. So we'll see how that goes. But I do think the Cavaliers are vulnerable. The Knicks have a real shot, even though it's, you know, two games, two games to make up in, in 15 or, or so. That doesn't sound like it. it's a lot, but it really is. It's hard to make up two games in only 15. But I think with that Cavs schedule, the Knicks do have a shot of making that happen. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, I think just my final thought on that Cleveland matchup, the fact that they're not at their best with their four best guys on the floor, like just screams imposter to me. And people could take this clip and throw it in my face if the Cavs come out and beat the Knicks. But like that 17 game winning streak, as or or was it? It wasn't seventeen. Game, but that seventeen and one stretch, seventeen and two stretch. They had that incredible stretch they had, where, where when the Knicks were kind of the best team in the NBA, like the Cavs might have actually been the best team in the NBA. The fact that that's without two of the four guys are going to be in their starting lineup, like as much as like, oh wow, it's amazing. We did this without Garland and without Mobley. Like that also sets off alarm bells to me. And if I was a Cavs fan, that would set off alarm bells and say like, all right, we are probably not optimally structured if if two of the key pieces of our franchise go out. And we're 17 and two, like there, there's maybe a better path here. And I think their lack of identity to some extent when those guys are on the floor and their lack of spacing is, is, is maybe the biggest thing when those guys are on the floor, like as much as Mobley and Allen have gotten better at, at, at passing the ball to each other and finding some chemistry, like even with better shooting at the three. And I think Struess is a big upgrade over what a Coral was last year. And I think their depth is much better. Craig Porter's a nice player. Like I am. I am at the end of the day. If the Knicks are mostly healthy, I'm, I'm kind of with you where I think that's a tough series. I don't think it's one the Knicks should lose. And look, and they have, they have two small guards that aren't great defenders in the backcourt. Yeah. And that's a very – and look, we're not, I'm not – let's not have this conversation now because we'll go another hour. But as the debate will rage on at the end of June, whether or not the Knicks should trade for Donovan Mitchell, you would be trading for the same problem that the Cavs have. Two small guards in the backcourt that are best with the ball in their hands, that aren't very good defenders, and is that the ideal use? And I love Donovan Mitchell. I don't have a bad word to say about the guy. Um, except that he's small. He doesn't play great defense. Um, and, it, you know, the, the match with Brunson is not great. The same way the match with Garland is not great. Um, and that's, I think, a challenge the Knicks will have to overcome if they decide to go down that route, which is what the Cavs are dealing with now. Yeah, you're not you're not getting a one plus one equals two with those guys. You're getting one nope, plus one not. equals 1.25 or something like that. All right, let, let's finish with, with another guard in the Knicks. Uh, Deuce McBride, um, obviously game, game of his life um, the other night has been – uh, has shot the ball beyond my wildest dreams. Has been just a, a better player beyond my wildest dreams. The Knicks have him on a ridiculously good three-year, thirteen million dollar contract. That if I'm Deuce, I'm I, I might be firing my agent <laughs> this offseason. Because that's that's looking very very generous towards the Knicks at this point. Um, but what do you think his future is ultimately on this team? Is to me, it's still very clear that I, I he's not he's not a backup point guard. Like you watched him try to initiate offense against Davion Mitchell, and it was it was it was ugly, and it was kind of a regression to what we saw from earlier this year. He seems to be an awesome undersized bench shooting guard. And I wonder like if the Knicks could find like the right, like maybe it's a Kyle Anderson type guy who like brings the ball up and nominally does the point guard things, but then can guard a two on the other end. And that's not that Deuce can't guard backup twos, but I'm just wondering how he's used. Is he eventually a trade chip? Because it's not on the Emmanuel quickly level where it's like, all right, he's just never going to be used appropriately in the Knicks. Like clearly they, they have minutes for him, but 
I'm just wondering how they maximize his value going forward because it, it just seems like he he is a shockingly awesome player given where they drafted him and what his current contract is. Yeah, he's a really good on ball defender. He's a good off ball defender, and he shoots the ball well. You know, and if you could do him too, it's not just like catch and shoot. Yeah. Yep. If, if you can do all that, you're going to be an effective NBA player. The problem is that he's six one, right? Yeah. And he's not long. Mm -hmm. So if you could somehow put him into a six, five body and, you know, give him a, a good wingspan, he'd be making $25 million a year. John, I just want to throw out there. He does. Point. He does have like a six ten wingspan because we looked it up the other day. Is it six ten? Really? Uh, I'm going to double check it right now, but I'm pretty sure Deuce McBride wings. Oh, wait, it's six. I'm sorry. I apologize. It's, six, it's like, it's a drop under six, nine. I, All I, right. I, that, 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 that's still yeah. excellent for a guy his size. Yeah. I honestly didn't realize it was that long. It makes sense given how often he gets his hands on the ball and he, you know, he's active around the basketball. So yeah, look, I think that certainly then would give him the advantage in terms of being able to guard six, four, six, five guys. What, what is he listed at six, one or six, two? He's like, he's a six, one, I think. Six, one. Yeah. But I think that length gives you a better shot against some of the smaller, quicker two guards in the league. Like he can guard either one of those Cavs players in the backcourt, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, but the problem is that you go up and you play Boston and they have like Jason Tatum playing the two. That ain't going to work. You know, <laughs> that's just not going to work in terms of how they how they run that offense. You know, you play the Clippers and he has to guard Harden or Paul George that ain't going to work. So I think you have to find spots for him. I don't know if he's ever going to be a 25, 30 minute game guy because of that limitation with his size. But I think based on matchup, you could definitely find ways to use him as a shooter off the bench, as a spark plug uh, to get your defense going a little bit. I think he sets a good tone. He's physical. You know, his decision-making, I still think, can use a little bit of work. To your point, when he gets pressured, it, there's a lot of dribbling around with nothing happening, and the shot clock just tick, 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 ticks away. But, look, I think you can figure out a way to use him in, in, in a way in 15, 20-minute spurts, depending on your matchup, and it'll help you. But um, I don't think he's ever going to be a, a quickly-level player just because, again, and again, I think the six eight and a half or 6'9 wingspan helps, whatever it is, but, you know, I still think he'll get bullied by some of the bigger guards out there. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think he's awesome in him. I'm really curious to see how it translates to the postseason, how quick of a hook tips has from him because we saw Quinn Grimes finish last season on an absolute heater. And then his defense totally translated. His offense did not translate to the playoffs. So I wonder if like, if Deuce gets a little stage right, or if like, because he's, he's just been so fearless and he's done it. I mean, look at the, the Warriors game on national TV the other night, like that Sixers game. Um, like the first game where he really went off, like right after the trade where he was, he was just completely fearless and maybe that's just who he is. And he's, he's a badass, and, and, and none of it will, uh, phase him. Um, yeah, he seems yeah. to have more of that personality than Grimes does, to be honest yeah. with you. Maybe, maybe mm. it's him being a former football player or whatever it is, but he does seem to have more of that. I would trust him. I think more in, in those spots in terms of hitting shots than Grimes, just because of the personality factor, maybe. Yeah. But we'll have to wait and see, you know, I, you don't know until you see it, uh, with, uh, with, with young guys in the postseason. In the past, he definitely seemed scared, and then this season something flipped, and it just like, and, and maybe it was just like actually getting to play a few games in a row, not feeling like that feeling that Obi always described, like if I miss a shot, I'm out. So he's he, he's he's been fantastic. I am super excited about his future. Uh, John Schmelk, uh, thank you so much for joining me, man. I'll, I'll always look back at uh, the pod we did after Game Four when you went to the game last year. I think I, I wanted to go like thirty minutes to so like an hour. That was one of the most fun podcasts I ever did. So I hope I hope we get to replicate that this postseason. I hope we get to do it with a fully healthy Knicks team. Um, thank you for coming on. Before I let you go, can you tell everyone one final time where they can find uh, all your great work? Because I'm sure there's plenty of Giants fans listening. Yeah, if you're a big Giants fan, you're out there. Um, we do great coverage of the draft. Uh, so check out Draft Season. That's our draft podcast. And then our other two podcasts, I'm sure people know, Big Blue Kickoff Live, that's our daily live show, 12.30 to 1.30. We take live calls from fans. And then our interview podcast is called The Giants Huddle. Um, this week, I'm getting on Randy Mueller, former Seahawks general manager, to talk about the draft and free agency for the Giants. Just recorded one with Sean O'Hara yesterday. He breaks down the X's and O's and the Giants' two new offensive linemen that they brought in. Uh, so a lot of good conversation. Again, you can find The Giants Huddle podcast, draft season, and Big Blue Kickoff on the Giants mobile app, giants.com slash podcast, or just search for any of them individual in your favorite podcast platform if you're a Giants fan. We will have everything covered for you through the draft. I've probably watched, oh boy, over 100 players at this point getting ready. Boy, you thought the NBA draft was hard, dude? Like, this is it, it's nothing. <laughs> the NBA level. draft is child's play. Yeah. This is it's a, it's a whole nother ball game with the NFL draft. But we'll have you covered. If you want to learn about these prospects, again, check out all our content. We'll have it for you. 
as, as, as Knicks fans, I think we all know it, it is uniquely exciting having a top six pick. You could talk yourself into it every time. And I, I, I weirdly think even though the NBA draft in general is more of a short thing and the NFL draft is the Giants take a wide receiver. I've, I've, I've a lot of confidence they're getting someone good. And if you want to learn about who they might take and, and when they actually take them, learn about them, uh, John is the only place you should be going. I mean, we are going to talk to you soon, buddy. Um, but until then, it's John. I'm Gavin. We'll talk to you all very, very soon on Locked on Knicks. 